Hello everyone. On behalf of Net Zero Alliance India and First View Group, I am Sakshi, extending a warm welcome to each and every one of you to our today's webinar on Net Zero Energy Roadmap, Iron and Steel. It is my pleasure to be here as your host. We would like to extend our gratitude to our partners, Tata Power, Sunshore, and Ampin Energy for their immense support to help organize this event. Many thanks to our esteemed guest speakers and the attendees for their valuable presence in today's webinar. Your active participation has contributed to making this event truly remarkable. I would now request my team to play the commercial video for Tata Power. playing that video. May I now request my team to play the commercial video for Sunshot. The renewable energy revolution has begun. Conventional sources of energy are proving too costly for the planet. As a renewable energy hotspot, India has the potential to lead the world's decarbonization journey. That's where we come in. Sunshore is India's fastest growing renewable energy company. We believe in delivering maximum impact by harnessing the power of RE technologies to supply round-the-clock clean energy to industries across the country. 
we run both intrastate and interstate plants to deliver green power at any scale of requirement. Since 2014, we have helped over 60 corporations transition to clean power, cut costs and achieve their ESG and RE100 goals. Our Investors Partners Group are powering Sunshore's vision of becoming one of the largest global renewable energy producers. India's renewable energy moment has arrived. Be a part of it. Thank you so much team for playing that video. May I now introduce Mr. Kartike Sharma, who is the co-founder for Sunshore, to present for his company. Over to you, Mr. Sharma. I believe you are on mute. Uh, you are not audible yet. Yes, uh, you're audible now. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry for the slight technical glitch. I wanted to start by extending my thanks to all the panelists for coming and getting together for discussing this very important topic for this very, very important sector for our country and at this very important time. And uh, I'm thankful to the Net Zero Alliance and Solar Quarter for putting this uh, event together. Without further ado, I will just get into a quick presentation which is a little where we will talk a little bit about sunshore but then we'll focus primarily on you know the potential avenues available today for the iron and in steel industry to reach a net zero future so sakshi can you see my screen fantastic thank you so much um so at Sunshore, very quickly, you know, we are uh, at the core a corporate decarbonization services company. We are focused on uh, helping industries across the country reach their RE100 goals. Uh, we are also one of the most well capitalized renewable energy companies focused on the CNI segment in India with over $400 million in commitment from Partners Group. And needless to say, we are a full stack independent power producer with capabilities across renewable energy technologies and all of it in house. So we do everything from project uh, development to execution and asset management within the company. Uh, Partners Group is a very, very well known name in the infrastructure sector globally with over nine gigawatts of renewable energy assets across the world. Uh, Sunshore is their exclusive platform in India and Southeast Asia. And we have a target to deploy over three gigawatts by 2027. And um, right now, our solutions include hybrid uh, around the clock power PPAs for industries from both intra state and interstate power plants. We also sell green attributes uh, to companies to reach their final mile of decarbonization. And we are very actively also working on certain industry models for virtual PPAs with consumers who are not able to procure power directly within India. Some of our customers, uh, you know, these are all, uh, we have 60 plus corporations that we are working with. These are some of our top customers, which are spread across the country. Our current open access projects are, like I said, both intrastate and interstate because we are very keenly focused on certain sectors and iron and steel is one of those. And uh, in steel heavy states like Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra and Karnataka, we have very large capacities that we will be building every year. And right now around one gigawatt, which includes a 450 megawatt interstate solar plant in Rajasthan and ISTS wind plants in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. 
is what we are uh, actively signing PBAs for. That was all about Sunshore. Uh, now I'd like to spend some time on our views for the net zero pathways for the iron and steel industry in India. So first of all, you know, iron and steel is one of the largest contributors to energy use uh, within the industry. So out of the 24% energy use that happens globally in uh, industry, almost 7.2%. So almost, you know, 25, 30% is actually made by iron and steel. So iron and steel industry truly is a base load energy use industry globally. And India is no different. Um, being part of that, you know, uh, and being such a, a, a great uh, power consumer, uh, obviously the contribution to emissions also are huge. So almost 11% of India's contribution to uh, uh, emissions come from the steel industry. And one third of direct, direct industrial emissions actually come from the steel industry. So the trend in India also mimics what happens globally. Lately, uh, you know, some uh, international regulations have emerged, which have uh, given great incentive to the metals and mining industry in general and the steel industry in particular to move to more greener power of greener sources of power. Most important one is the CBAM framework that the EU has introduced, which basically uh, necessitates the use of green power for steel manufacturing if it is being exported to any EU country. And uh, from India, you know, a significant part of India's production actually goes to EU and this will impact our steel manufacturers severely. And that's why we are seeing a lot of renewable energy, a lot of steel and iron and steel and metals mining company adopt renewable energy very, very fast. Other countries like USA and Singapore, which are also, you know, uh, target markets for our exports are also contemplating such measures which will further uh, you know improve the use case for the iron and steel industry so you know the iron and steel industry has a lot of uh, any lot of you know incentives to reach net zero you know of course if we start uh, using renewable energy for to manufacture steel we can um, offset you know a lot of um, forex that ends up being spent for importing coal or importing other fossil fuels which are used in the manufacturing of uh, steel and uh, you know other metals um, the and then the government has taken a lot of initiatives to help the decarbonization so just beyond even beyond you know just the green power usage usage of green hydrogen uh, to help uh, you know to replace the coal and coke that is used in the steel manufacturing process is also being pushed by the government of India and uh, hydrogen is being you know uh, labeled as one of the one of the uh, key technologies with which India can uh, become a global leader in in the energy supply chain uh, but of course there are a lot of challenges uh, for the sector to really be able to reach net zero the biggest one is you know the sheer availability of the right kind of regulations or technology which can help the sector decarbonize deeply. Green hydrogen obviously is in a very nascent stage, so not very reliable at the moment. But we know that you know some of the largest companies are working on this and will soon become a reality. Uh, and then carbon capture and storage will be you know the next thing that that uh, the industry has to adopt. So overall, to reach net zero, we see that there are three primary pillars. One is that for the energy use the industry must go net zero, which basically means one is, you know, electrifying the process or using green hydrogen for your blast furnace. Then once you have electrified your manufacturing process, you know, drawing more and more of that uh, power from renewable energy. In fact, a big challenge today for, for the metals and mining industry is to move away from CPPs, which are massive in scale, 100, 200, going up to four, 500 megawatts. Uh, so getting those kind of connectivities from the grid in the regions in which steel industries operate is also a very big challenge. But yes, once you come over that, then the road to net zero becomes easier because you can get 70% there by simply buying renewable energy from off-site, be it intrastate or interstate, and I'll talk more about that. The remaining 30%, of course, has to be done through, uh, you know, uh, adopting practices such as circular economy, 
and you know uh, initiating supply chain decarbonization for your downstream and upstream um, supply chain of course downstream a lot of companies have already uh, done a lot of greening it is the upstream where uh, industries are today looking at very seriously and trying to figure out what is possible now in energy use you know open access pps can help you uh, if it's intrastate it can help you do around 60% but interstate pps can actually help you do almost 75 to 80 percent today and uh, that is in fact becoming the most attractive option for the iron and steel industry especially for upstream plants and whatever remains can be you know offset using green attributes or some on-site solar power plants um, a lot of benefits of using open access power of course you know savings 35 to 40 percent savings on your energy expenses you go captive, you get a waiver on CSS at an additional surcharge. Um, you have no risk to project development technology or operations of these large scale complex energy solutions because you know developers like Sunshore can actually take all of that risk and simply ask you to pay a very nominal price for the power, which will be fixed in fact for 25 years. So this is a great advantage for the metals and mining industry because uh, being dependent on coal based or natural gas based power, they are exposed to significant commodity risk from these uh, fossil fuels. And of course, uh, most importantly, you are able to drastically reduce your scope 2 and even scope 3 emissions if you use green attributes along with uh, using green power. So it's a very, very compelling business case. And that is why some of the largest companies, even public sector companies, uh have gone out and you know uh, so on to reach net zero and are already taking very very big strides in adopting renewable energy across the country um so i will just do a very brief view of intrastate versus interstate renewable energy uh so for you know uh we believe that for uh, demands up to 25 or 30 megawatt uh in states such as maharashtra where intrastate solar is very, uh, you know, streamlined uh, would make a lot of sense for those kind of demands because you can offset almost 45 to 60 percent of your energy use um, within Maharashtra by using intrastate solar. And you save a lot of money because you save almost 45 percent on every unit that you generate. And if you are able to offset around 60 percent, then you can say goodbye to almost 25 percent of your energy use. Most of these uh, facilities are connected on 132 kV EHV supply. So the additional overhead on top of the contracted price is very small. So you fix 3 rupees 60 pesa for 15, 20 or 25 years for renewable energy. And on top of that, you only pay around 1.22, which is variable. But as you can all see, almost 75%, 85% of your uh, renewable energy tariff is fixed. So you are able to hedge. Uh, something that is impossible to do with natural gas or coal. Uh, in ISTS, it becomes even more interesting because ISTS, you can go up to 75 or 80 percent of greening um, through, you know, round the clock power supply from solar and wind hybrid plants. And here, uh, you know, in my conversations with metals and mining companies, the biggest concern has been that, you know, uh, these companies are looking to get power before June 2025 because of the waiver on CTU charges. But, you know, even if uh, you're able to get power beyond June 2025, the, Im the, uh, uh, the impact of CTU charges, the 25% levy of CTU charges is actually very small as compared to what is what companies are paying to the grid today. So uh, I would say that, you know, uh, round the clock, renewable energy, a mix of solar and wind, which helps you give a maximum possible CUF, maybe 74 or 80% kind of CUF is a great option to massively decarbonize and is super economical. And uh, in fact, can can very well rival the kind of savings that intrastate solar gives you because even though the per unit saving might be less, but the overall greening is very high. So if you're able to offset 30, uh, you know, 80% of your power and save 33% per unit, you are again looking at 26-27% reduction in power supply and energy price certainty for uh, 15 to 25 years. So that's uh, that's it. Of course, all these projects have to be done in captive structuring and you know looking forward to discuss more as part of the panel discussion on this. Uh, thank you.
Thank you so much for that. Um, may I now request my team to uh, play the video for commercial video for our Ampin. Ampin Energy Transition is India's leading renewable energy transition platform. With the current portfolio of about 3 gigawatts spread across 17 states in the country, Ampin has a balanced portfolio of CNI and utility customers, which allows it to provide clean and green energy solutions to 60 plus marquee customers across 10 diverse sectors, such as pharmaceuticals, automobiles, cement, steel, heavy engineering, infrastructure, FMCG, educational institutions, IT and data centers, utilities and government bodies. Some of these customers are amongst countries' leading corporates such as Škoda Auto Volkswagen India, Sipla, Bharti Airtel, Britannia, AB InBev, Tata Hitachi, Orient Cement, LNT Metro Rail, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, to name a few. Ampin Energy Transition believes in building long-term relationship with its customers and act as a one-stop shop for energy across different geographies and technologies such as solar, wind, hybrids, storage and energy management. This helps the customers in reducing their overall energy costs and mitigating their carbon footprint. Ampin has developed a clear roadmap and has the ability to offer a complete end-to-end -end solution of taking any customer to 100% RE and can meet short-term, medium-term and long-term requirements of its customers. Having the backing of leading international institutional investors such as AIIB, ICG, SMBC, LGT Lightrock, CIP, CBRE Caledon and CIIF Kotak, Ampin Energy Transition has a deep debt in equity financing expertise and adheres to high ESG and corporate governance standards in compliance with IFC standards. With a unique capability to straddle utility scale RE projects, power markets, battery energy storage, and CNI RE projects in India and beyond. Ampin Energy Transition is well on its way to reaching a 10 gigawatt portfolio and becoming a true market leader and a powerhouse in delivering tomorrow's energy today. Ampin Energy Transition is providing you clean energy through day and night. I think uh, there was a, I don't know whether it was at my end, uh, at least the video was not coming properly, maybe, you know, it uh, probably was not getting streamed properly. So, anyway, uh, I would start with the presentation and probably if I, uh, maybe it was, you know, trying to stream it from the drive, so that's the reason. It didn't come properly, which is fine. I'll just uh, share my presentation and uh, start. Yeah, is my uh, presentation visible? Yes, sir. If you could just keep it on the slideshow mode, yes. I know. Yeah, uh, is it visible now? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Right? Oh, okay, fine. So, uh, I'm sorry, I my apologies. I think it was trying to take some drive and it was not getting streamed properly. 
So we are a three gigawatt portfolio company. We are present in 17 different states across India, and we are at present constructing all kinds of renewable energy, whether it is wind, whether it is solar, whether it is wind solar hybrid, whether it is floating solar. We are doing, you can see out over here at Ankleshwar, uh, 140 megawatt, uh, a very prestigious project. 600 megawatt, the largest uh, floating solar uh, park is getting developed over there. And uh, on in different, I mean, that one part is with this uh, utility, and another almost one gigawatt is with the uh, CNI, because we are a very CNI focused uh, company. And this has been the growth story of uh, Ampin, and uh, you can see stage by stage from starting from 2016 17 onwards how Ampin has grown. Uh, to whatever level today it has come to and thanks to our investors who have invested and some of them have even reinvested like FNDC. Uh, so on the left hand side you see our uh, investors who are from Europe and uh, primarily the US and then right hand side you will find our lenders. This is the team uh, of uh, Pinaki uh, started Ampin and the real team is the Ari portfolio from 2007-2008 and one uh, a very specific feature about Ampin is that we believe power is a state subject. So we have our regional presence, very strong regional presence. We have a full budget office, for example, I'm speaking from the Kolkata office and our mandate is to develop the eastern side of the market which includes states like Orissa, states like Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, West Bengal, all the northeastern uh, states. We have specific people who are responsible heading the BD, uh, the utility side, and the CNI side, and of course the, key, the different uh, operational heads. Uh, now this is the ESG governance and uh, we do follow uh, strict uh, 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 ESG governance is uh, followed in the organization. Uh, and then I'll now, uh, you know, come to the uh, solution part of it. So it's a stage by stage uh, programmatic approach and we will discuss in more details about this. Uh, on site is your behind the meter rooftop, you have off site where you can do the low hanging intrastate and then you can go to ISTAs also, but that's something of the future we will discuss in more detail. What are the issues, challenges with ISTAs at present? And still you will find that it is not possible to get 100% of the energy through RE. So, uh, you know, I mean, through, through physical, uh, physical, by physical means that, uh, you know, the balance of the portion you would take through BPPA. Uh, these are the different uh, customers that we have and these are the different segments almost in all the segments whether it is auto, pharma, heavy industry, uh, uh, we are present uh, real estate, we are present uh, everywhere. These are the big large utility plants uh, uh, and of course these are there at the western side of India, some in the central. I mentioned about the uh, floating solar project, then we have this Seki project at Rajasthan of various capacity, some are hybrid, uh, some are uh, pure uh, solar projects. These are the different CNI projects for us. We are there at present operational in uh, uh, Maharashtra, in Karnataka, uh, in uh, uh, UP, uh, and then uh, in Gujarat, uh, we are now supplying power from our hybrid plant, and also we are developing in the state, three eastern states, which we are developing at uh, Orissa, uh, Chhattisgarh, and West Bengal. These are the uh, different, uh, you know, uh, key uh, behind the meter projects. We have done one of the largest, which is actually the largest in the automobile sector, which is at Skoda, uh, Pune. Uh, so that there we have developed 18.5. That has happened in two stages. Then uh, we have, in fact, the largest industrial project in West Bengal, Tata Itachi, 10.5 megawatt. Is here we have done metro rail project, Kochi Metro, LNT Metro, uh, which were very challenging. So just you know, probably uh, we are technology agnostic. Uh, we do follow uh, high ESG governance, and we have a balanced portfolio, a part in utility, another part in CNI, uh, 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 and we deal with all the technologies, whether it is solar, wind, 
hybrid floating or energy storage now let me come quickly to our topic of discussion today and uh, i would not spend much of the of time over here so these are the ghd gas emission which we are talking about of uh, the challenge is to make it net zero by capturing uh, by reducing the carbon dioxide emission um, already this has been dealt with that what is what are the how uh, we i mean the industries uh, which of course we need uh, would be polluting at the same time and now let us you know come to the uh, uh, the solutions and what we find is although the industries are polluting some of them have taken uh, net zero goals and we can see this uh, years by which they have their own net zero goals now this is the road map what you know we have been discussing uh, so far uh, the road map to 100% re and if we talk about the market maturity on site of course uh, is there uh, interested open access is known to all uh, now iscas is uh, gaining some traction but there are many inherent problems there we will discuss that as we go through and we have you know finally the vpca which also you know we have signed some of the agreements and which uh, is also happening uh, as some of you know, the different uh, in the steel industries uh, data centers they need uh, uh, they want to go for 100% re Uh, this is once again a very standard model uh, uh, following electricity rule of 2005. 26%. You have to uh, subscribe to the equity, and that's how you are protected from uh, leaving of any cross subsidy surcharge or any uh, additional surcharge. And the uh, if the project is done at a 70-30, so it's actually 7.8% of the project cost which a customer would be uh, investing in. Now uh, this is uh, one slide which I wanted to talk about, and this is the open access uh, map of India. So far, what we find is that Tamil Nadu has done um, probably most, uh, you know, of the open access, followed by Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, uh, you know, after that, it's almost Madhya Pradesh something, and rest of them are uh, with the balance. now we just mentioned about uh, uh, intra state and inter state open access there are a few challenges when we talk about uh, there are certain advantages certain disadvantages our understanding is that uh, even with energy banking states which have provided energy banking open access has grown like anything over there we have worked very closely with the government of odisha for last one and a half year and today we have a fantastic policy in odisha Chhattisgarh actually at present has the best uh, you know renewable energy policy. They have 12 months uh, uh, energy banking. But once again, like any, all good things, that's also going to come to an end very soon. Uh, the, uh, the 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 so these with this probably one can go to even 70 percent plus of you know green energy replacement even with intrastate solar. Your TUF being as low as 25 to 26 percent. Because you have the banking, wherever you have the banking support from the from the state. Now, in case of IFCA, one needs to uh, obtain power with every 15 minutes. The laws are developing now. Central uh, has made CA the authority. Now, who would do the captive? Provide the captive status. All these questions are, you know, uh, will have to be answered in the coming days, and states will have to agree. to what the center is telling and that a little more complex process but however probably in the long run that would also happen uh, then uh, this is a case study which we did and we have actually done that for one pharma major and you can see they did on site then they did you know and we got in three states maharashtra goa and then finally they are uh, they are signed the bbpa So what you can see is how step by step they have, you know, they are going to 100% RE, and uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, based on their different uh, units over all over India, and even in the why do you see, you know, such a high uh, jump in the VPPA? The reason is that they have also included their suppliers, and that's the reason that you know the VPPA uh, quantum is looking much more when compared to the physical power which is directly being supplied to them. and this is a very good example uh so uh, we also are in green hydrogen and uh, we are there for 
uh, uh, I'll show you this is an interesting chart for green hydrogen. You need 24 into 7 RE power. So the states that are offering cheaper power, a uh, green power, they, you know, you can probably develop green hydrogen over there, provided you have an RE, RE, RTC requirement for such uh, green hydrogen. And uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, in the process of discussing with customers for green hydrogen uh, in some of these states. Uh, we have our partners both in TEM as well as in Alkaline. We have our own, you know, targets. Uh, and then now coming to the REC part of it, because the first part I discussed was, you know, the on-site solar, the off-site solar to ISPS or uh, intrastate. Then uh, I discussed about this uh, hydrogen, which would be, you know, another, uh, uh, well, I mean, which would be probably a uh, good, I mean, good thing to come in in the future. And then I talked about REC's. Now in uh, REC's, if we see at the much, I mean, today probably they sell at one rupee. But then this is, has been the trend of REC so far. So the green oblig of the obligated entities can fulfill their green requirements through REC and also through IREX. And there is a procedure through which you can get enlisted to IREX. And, uh, you know, uh, IREX is of course not regulated in India. That is there for the Western market and for the Indian market, you can have, uh, uh, you know, uh, REX, which is the REC. So uh, with that, I come to an end, and uh, I would uh, would be happy to answer any question if you have any uh, during the panel discussion or now. So much uh, for that insightful presentation, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, as we all are aware, creating a net zero energy roadmap for industries like iron and steel is a crucial step in addressing climate change and achieving sustainability goals. These industries are known for their significant carbon emissions due to the energy intensive processes involved. By prioritizing energy efficiency, renewable energy integration, material efficiency, waste management, R&D, and employment engagement, these industries can transition towards carbon neutrality while maintaining competitiveness and ensuring long-term sustainability. In today's webinar, we will delve into how the iron and steel industries are doing their part in addressing climate change and achieving sustainability goals. Before we proceed, I would like to make a brief announcement here. We encourage all attendees to actively engage in the discussion by posting their questions in the Q&A box. Our esteemed panel speakers will address these questions during the interactive Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. Uh, just that, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Uh, is it possible because I think if I play from my system the video, uh, probably, you know, I think you were all kind of facing challenges, right? While uh, we were trying to uh, play the video, because I don't think that there was a lot of disturbance which was coming. So, shall I try once before we move to the next section? Uh, sir, the video was playing perfectly fine for us. Probably there was an oh. internet glitch at your end, because my oh, team and I were fine. able to view it well. Oh, okay, fine. Sure, sir. No worries. Uh, without any further delay now, let us begin our highly anticipated panel discussion session for today. It is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel of experts who will share their insights and expertise on the topic at hand. We have with us Mr. Karti from CEEW who will be moderating the session, uh, Dr. Priyadarshini from Hindalco Industries, uh, Mr. Varun Chopra from Gare India, Mr. Kartike Sharma from Sunshore and Mr. Sobik Das from Ampin Energy. Mr. Kartik India will be the moderator for the session. Uh, over to you, Mr. Kartik. Hi, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear my voice. Yes, you're audible. Hi. Hello, everyone. I want to start by saying thank you for inviting me here today. It's a unique opportunity and I'm grateful to be a part of this important discussion. Before we dive into our conversation, let me take a moment to introduce my organization, CEW. 
the council on energy environment and water is one of asia's leading not for profit policy research institutions the uh, the council impact sustainability development at scale with that with data integrated analysis and strategic outreach to explain and change the use reuse and misuse of resources we broadly work under three themes transformation quality of life and the enablers in each theme each team has dedicated teams working to uh, to address specific challenges i am working in the industrial sustainability team under the theme of transformation cew has a dedicated team of over 250 professionals we are actively engaged with 22 state governments and various central ministries working towards impactful and sustainability solutions once again uh, i welcome all the panelists i'm truly delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this insightful discussion surrounded by extreme experts from various fields their collaborative knowledge and expertise promise a rich and informative conversation we have a stellar panel to deliberate on the decarbonization in india i would like to invite our panelist uh, dr predarshni mr varun chopra mr saubik das and mr kartikeya narayan sharma for the panel discussion before we start the panel discussion i would like to introduce our panelist to the audience Dr. Pradeshni brings over 22 years of experience in CSR, social development, ESG, corporate affairs, and sustainability. She is currently the AVP at Hindalco Industries Limited, serving as the head of community relations and sustainability in Odisha, Bhuneshwar. Dr. Pradeshni is known for the spread. spearheading multi million CSR activities and advocating for women's empowerment, education. LGBTQ rights and tribal welfare. She has received prestigious awards such as Outstanding Women Icon CSR Leadership Role 2023 and ESG Thought Leader of the Year. It's a pleasure to have you on the panel, uh, Dr. Pradeshni. I would like Thank to. Thank you so much, uh, Kartikeya ji. Thank you. I would like to introduce our second speaker. Varun, Mr. Varun. Varun is an accomplished business leader with over twenty-two years of global experience in delivering strategic and operational P and L results across diverse industries. Currently serving as the executive chairman of Gear India, the country's leading material handling equipment rental company. Varun is driving a transformation with the organization. He focused on reshaping. its vision culture strategy and structure while capitalizing on india's mhe industry potential with a strong emphasis on sustainability solution varun aims to lead the adoption of zero emission based mhes to support both customer net zero journeys and india's sustainability future thank you for uh, taking time to join us over the panel uh, mr ben many varun. thanks karthik it's a pleasure to join this panel Uh, good afternoon everyone hi now i would like to introduce our third speaker mr saubik docs uh, we had uh, just listened a wonderful presentation from him mr saubik Saub docs is a seasoned professional with over 22 years of experience in contract management power purchase agreements project planning procurement strategy and more uh, spanning diverse power projects including solar boiler electrostatic precipitator projects he is known for his effective communication and relationship management skills enabling him to relate people at all levels of business finally uh, uh, thank, thank you, you for thank your, you. your time mr sobik das thank you thank you kartik thanks a lot look forward to a very interactive discussion yes uh, thank you finally i would uh, like to introduce our fourth speaker Mr. Kartikeya uh, Narayan Sharma. Mr. Kartikeya Narayan Sharma is a uh, data scientist with a background in civil engineering and extensive extensive training in town planning. He brings a wealth of experience in creating analytical assets for Fortune 500 uh, companies across diverse sector, including technology, steel, fashion, telecom, and tra travel and tourism. Now, once again, we had heard one more uh, very good presentation from uh, Mr. Kartikeya Sharma. Uh, 
thank you for your time uh, taking time to join us uh, in this panel uh, mr kartikeyan thank you kartik hi hi uh, before we jump to our panel discussion i would like to express my thanks to for the informative presentation uh, we have seen from the renewable energy providers it's truly inspiring to see the latest progress and the impressive work happening in the uh, in the renewable energy field now as we shift our focus to today's panel discussion i want to emphasize that at the council we firmly believe in the importance of energy efficiency and adoption of renewable energy sources as the initial steps towards the decarbonization any industry not only iron and steel any industry these approaches hold significant potential for reducing our carbon footprint advancing sustainability considering that industrial emissions contribute a substantial 30% of overall emission it is clear that we have to play a critical role in addressing this challenge uh, i will first turn to you uh, uh, dr pradeshini considering uh, that the aluminum industry emissions are primarily linked to the electric electricity consumption could you elaborate on the strategy the industry is employing to reduce its carbon footprint furthermore we would like to hear about the sustainability initiatives your organization is actually pursuing uh thank you mr karthik and a very uh, good afternoon to everyone um, and i'm thankful to the net zero energy roadmap uh, iron and steel for uh, making us part of this uh, knowledge sharing platform uh, so as far as hindalco's decarbonization effort and impact is concerned hindalco uh, industries limited is a metal flagship company of aditya billa group an industry leader in aluminium and copper uh, it is positioned as world's largest flat roll product player and recycler of aluminium in india uh, the company actually operates across the value chain comprising bauxite mining coal mining captric power plants alumina refinery aluminium smelting and downstream rolling along with extrusion and foils Uh, globally hindalco ranks among the global aluminium majors as an integrated producer along with its subsidiaries nobilis and aleris in aluminium downstream products at a footprint in 10 countries outside india so in terms of energy consumption and carbon intensity of aluminium as a sector there are two key parallel narratives uh, to be one has to understand actually so number one is the aluminium making is an energy intensive process so refined ore aluminum oxide that is alumina is electrolyzed uh, the only commercially known process used to manufacture aluminum globally so this electrolysis is an aluminum uh, in aluminum smelters is a very energy intensive in india uh, you know the hydropower as we were discussing and h2 was not uh, and the natural gas availability Uh, to all the plants are very um, um, you know uh, challenging at this point of time so all the smelters are mostly running in uh, captive uh, thermal power plants the second thing is uh, aluminum is infinitely recyclable and lightweighted material so the recycle of aluminum means the recycled metal consumes 95% less energy to produce as compared to the primary metal is a lightweight of, uh, of which offers opportunity to reduce energy consumption and carbon footprint in other sectors thus recently uh, hindalco has acquired uh, nobilis and aleris uh, and nobilis basically more mostly work on the aluminum recycling for example you know it offers reduction in vehicular ghg emissions uh, very useful in building and construction and to replace plastic packaging for food pharmaceuticals aluminum is also uh, not only this but aluminum is also deliver significant energy and carbon dioxide uh, saving in the use co2 saving uh, in the use of phase and has a potential to be produced in a carbon neutral way so hindalco has based its decarbonization strategy to address these two aspects and relies on three levers uh, those are uh, reducing energy consumption and uh, changing energy mix where these initiatives uh, hindalco has achieved 24% reduction of energy consumption uh, uh, and 50 uh, um, in 2006 and 15% in uh, you know 
uh, in the FY base. Similarly, the GHG emission 22% reduction from FY06 base to 14% reduction from FY15 base. So how it is achieving that technology driven growth that we are focusing on the two new aluminum smelters are with the state of art AP360 technology and Utkal Alumina refinery is one of the most energy efficient globally and lower production of aluminum in the world a plant which has you know technologically advanced. The second is energy efficiency improvement of existing facilities through specific improvement projects, that is, use of copper inserted uh, collector bar at Hirakud the smelter is a global first on a low amperage smelter and has been patented. So when we talk about renewable energy uh, projects, the company has so far implemented renewable projects at five locations, totaling to almost 100 megawatt. Uh, almost 35 megawatt is in Sambalpur, um, you know, uh, and uh, 5 megawatt in Utkal, Mahan. So some together we have projects at different phases of its implementation and to take to, you know, has taken the entire renewable supply of energy to 100 megawatt. Further, we are also coming up with uh, floating solar in um, the Hirakud Reservoir. Uh, so that's the future uh, wave ahead that we have. Now the other uh, thing that that uh, you know I wanted to emphasize when we talk about uh, how do we uh, you know what is the base of our decarbonation strategy? The second is the future growth focus in downstream and use of recycled aluminium. So Hindalco through subsidiary Navalis has invested heavily in developing aluminium recycling uh, and leads uh, global aluminium recycling with sixty percent of its products coming from recycled aluminium. Our closed loop aluminum recycling system allows us to take back as much as of our customer scrap as possible, turning it back into some product again, thus supports in developing the circular economy. The third is product stewardship towards the aluminization of global economic growth, that the aluminum deliver energy and CO2 saving in many sectors, that is, so it's used in producing solar panels, wind turbines, lightweight vehicles, energy efficient buildings, and transmission cables uh, for the transfer of renewable electricity in India. Apart from traditional supply to the uh, these areas, we are also developing products that have huge CO2 reduction potential. Uh, like we have recently launched aluminium bulkers, uh, which promotes uh, greater fuel efficiency than conventional bulkers, and also uh, has a longer li uh, life. Uh, you know, uh, life. We have also launched India's first aluminium freight trailers, uh, which is 50% uh, lighter, uh, saves considerable fuel and 70% higher scrap value as well. So looking at all these, we have uh, uh, you know, a very well uh, defined roadmap for ahead um, how we will reduce our you know, energy requirement through fossil fuel and how we will go to further towards recycling. Uh, with this, if you talk about certain sustainability initiative, a major transition to renewable energy, where we are trying to shift from fossil fuel to renewable energy. Uh, carbon capture and storage is something that, you know, CCS technology, where we are capture carbon dioxide emission. So we are working on that. Uh, recycling, as I mentioned, and sustainable sourcing that we are, uh, you know, so um, we have our own raw material like bauxite and uh, mining where we ensure you know, sustainable mining. Um, and we are with Zinto, we are the number one organization which has put on the mining charter, sustainable mining charter in India. Also, we are working on electrolytic cell advancement, research and development uh, is going on on that level. Carbon-free smelter technology is something that we are also looking, um, going ahead and out sales inner tenor cells and high temperature electrolysis uh, technologies uh, which will revolutionize aluminium production by eliminating carbon emission uh, also the supply chain optimization is what we are looking you know, working ahead to so reduce the emission uh, which, which involves improving transport uh, efficiency reducing waste minimizing energy logistic and distribution of aluminium products so government initiatives and uh, regulation in terms of governance that we are working closely, uh, you know, and, uh, which includes carbon pricing mechanism, tax incentives, 
we are working along with the government for the aluminium sector so these are few of um, you know in a large in a nutshell this is what overall that we are doing Mm, environmental stewardship with renewable energy, as I said, right? recycling, bauxite mining practices. I want to emphasize that that you know we have uh, very very uh, strategically focusing sustainable mining, reforestation, land land rehabilitation. Uh, uh, um, for example, creating more water structure and uh, minimizing the environmental impact on the mining operations. Uh, very important to our operation is the community that we are uh, operating around. Uh, so typically uh, we are working and today we have a, a foot footprint of almost 5 lakh um, you know, beneficiaries under our community development initiatives. So these are few things uh, that uh, we have in pipeline when we talk about sustainability overall and uh, energy requirement in the aluminium sector and what Hindalco is doing. Uh, Mr. Karthik, you are muted, uh, sir. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tidishni. It was very nice to hear uh, what are the initiatives has been taken by Hindalco. And uh, uh, thank you once again. Uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, now, uh, Mr. Varun, uh, just uh, I would like to say that in steel industry needs uh, a capex for uh, their decarbonization efforts. Now, my question is related to the uh, capex uh, expenditures. Uh, so, uh, considering the uh, substantial capex expenditure required for the decarbonization efforts, what strategies or mechanisms can Indian steel industries explore? Uh, and secure low carbon uh, financing and res resources to drive its decarbonization in uh, in initiatives effectively. Could you uh, shed uh, any light on it? Sure. Uh, thank you, Karthik. Uh, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I think uh, clearly, um, and you know, uh, Karthik spoke about it extensively, which is the renewable energy part. Uh, Dr. Lopamudra spoke about uh, various I would say sustainability focused initiatives uh, within aluminum and bauxite at the Hindalco group. Now, when you look at CapEx, uh, now you've got to first maybe just take a step behind Karthik and understand that, uh, you know, when you look at net zero, um, you know, you're, you're clearly talking about scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's, it's uh, about getting net zero on all three. Now, please bear in mind that scope one is where these are company owned assets and that's where a significant amount of capex tends to happen. Uh, now, this is this would clearly entail, uh, you know, when you move to, uh, you know, green hydrogen as a source of energy with respect to manufacturing of, uh, you know, steel. Uh, and that is where you would end up, uh, of course, uh, you know, um, helping transition to net zero. Uh, within the scope one part, uh, but that would entail a significant amount of money. Uh, I think from a financing point of view, Karthik, uh, there are uh, different, uh, I would say, ESG-focused uh, finance options. Uh, these are still, I would say, uh, not as pervasive uh, as one would uh, one would expect or one would like, uh, but this is something which is clearly picking up space. You know, uh, I would like to maybe just maybe pivot on on this question to say that, you know, uh, uh, when you look at the steel industry, uh, the biggest emissions actually come uh, within uh, scope three, um, you know, uh, and this is where uh, not, uh, you know, which are indirect, indirectly uh, run, uh, you know, vehicles, etc., can play a significant role. Uh, in fact, everything that you then use in your factory or warehousing, everything needs to come from a net zero source. And that is what is going to take maximum time. So my, uh, you know, my, my submission uh, would be that uh, with respect to scope three, uh, one of the things uh, that one can really focus on is the supply chain, because the supply chain decarbonization uh, in fact, the supply chain accounts for more than 60% of the carbon emissions uh, within the whole process. And uh, uh, and moving to, you know, zero emission uh, yeah. And this could be whether it's commercial vehicles, whether it's it's your small, 
you know, three dealers uh, which can be used uh, for, uh, you know, last mile transportation. Uh, and I think within factories and warehouses specifically, Karthik, uh, one could move to zero emission material handling equipment, i.e. forklifts, breech trucks, battery operated pallet trucks, etc. Uh, in fact, uh, just to maybe digress a bit and, um, you know, it's, it's quite a coincidence, but uh, Dr. Lopamitra, to share with you, we have the privilege of partnering with Hindalco on a number of sites, including Taloja, uh, Mahan, Renukut, uh, and Sambalpur. Uh, in fact, a number of these sites, we've already deployed uh, zero emission lithium-ion uh, MHEs, uh, which helps in you know transitioning to net zero uh, and thereby plays a critical role on the scope three part. So, so Karthik, uh, I think the CapEx pit is a very large piece uh, which would take, uh, it to summarize the, the, the particular question, which would take significant amount of investment primarily on green hydrogen, et cetera, to make the process uh, of manufacturing a lot more, uh, I would say, environment friendly to move to net zero. My uh, sincere request, submission to, uh, you know, to, to the industry folks, and I think all the, uh, you know, esteemed panelists as well as participants would be, you know, try to look at a low-hanging fruit, uh, you know, migrate or transition to zero emission MHEs, uh, which, you know, and if you take it on rental, uh, it, it probably is something that you can get within uh, four to six months. Uh, so it's it's quite a, uh, I would say, a win-win, uh, win, actually, win for the, the government or the regulator. As you know, India's net zero target is 2070. It's a win-win for the customer uh, because it helps decarbonize and clearly, it's a win-win for uh, for the end customer or the end consumer as well. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, and uh, nicely articulate. Uh, uh, you had uh, uh, put in the words. Uh, now, my next uh, my next question to you, Mr. Sobik uh, Das. Uh, during your uh, interactions, during your presentation, you mentioned uh, about uh, ISTS, that means uh, interstate transmission system and intrastate transactions. Uh, can you explain the main difference between these two and how do they affect our efforts to make energy more sustainable and eco-friendly? Uh, Mr. Das, you're on mute. Yeah, so uh, thanks, thanks, Kashi, uh, thanks for this question. In fact, we have been, you know, working closely with the state, for example, the state of Odisha, and uh, interestingly, Hindalco also is there. So uh, uh, we wanted, you know, I mean, when we discussed with the state government and all the state government feel that there should be a policy which should support intrastate growth of power plants, right? This is decentralized energy. Now, there, if you see even the Odisha policy, it gives a, a, a head start to the industry, in, I mean, uh, the intrastate plants by waiving off certain charges, by providing certain banking support, etc. And uh, if the transactions would take place within the state. So, what in a nutshell it is, that it's very clearly defined. Uh, a transaction, but then there is only one challenge what we find today. That challenge is, uh, you know, your energy replacement. End of the day, the organization would try to maximize the energy, you know, energy replacement from brown to green. Uh, of course, uh, that, I mean, they would like to be more green. And uh, at the same time, uh, these are cost-effective energy solutions. So uh, that would also reduce the wetted average uh, cost of power. Now, when we come to ISTS transactions, and we were the first to highlight all the gaps to probably to uh, CERT, uh, the generating state is one, the consumption state is another, we know what happened with OPG, and we also, you know, uh, that they tried and that model couldn't succeed much because you need to, someone needs to certify. And, you know, if we talk about uh, the, uh, the, the uh, CRT, ACRTs are all at a par. Uh, now, uh, probably the government of India would, I mean, CRT, now 
CA, which is which are so far has been a technical body, they have been named as the nodal agency. But then uh, the states, the different states, will have to ratify the uh, uh, RNDC record uh, regarding the consumption and the uh, uh, what you call the uh, 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 generation. Because end of the day, we are all captive plants, and we have to have some captive certification. Now, in case of uh, interstate, to our mind, it's a low hanging fruit. The reason being that this is uh, wherein everything is pretty well defined. Uh, only probably challenge is maybe you know you can uh, offtake till 70 percent, whereas you may go up to even 80 percent today in in case of ICS solution. Provided you also include storage, laws are yet to come on the storage. But what we understand, the renting, etc., lease model probably would be possible. So, why ISPS is something of the future, things would evolve, and there would definitely be, you know, you would require a, some sort of a cooperation between the state and the central agencies. Uh, our understanding is that, uh, you know, with a sort of a net of settlement at the end of the month, where it is not uh, transacted uh, uh, for every uh, 15 minutes uh, of, uh, I mean, and then you don't lose mandatorily any energy wherever you have any sudden shutdown, etc. Uh, probably an intrastate transaction is a, 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 a useful or a very low hanging fruit uh, in terms of uh, greening your uh, uh, energy effort in terms of your uh, net zero goals. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Thank you, Sorok. Sobik. Thank you, Sobik. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, my same question uh, that I would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Karthike Narayan uh, Sharma. Uh, just as, as shown in your informative presentation, Sanchuri is aggressively expanding in the open access method uh, of green power procurement. Uh, there are a lot of options available in the market at the moment, like uh, intrastate or uh, just now, uh, as Sovik has said, uh, intrastate versus uh, in interstate open access and solar versus uh, uh, wind versus hybrid. In this context, in the in the context of steel industry, what are the key considerations that a customer must think about while uh, deciding to go one of these options? <laughs> Hi, Karthik. Sorry, I got disconnected for a minute there. So uh, I might have missed the starting of your question. But what I what I realize, what I think you're asking me is that uh, when you're thinking, when a customer is thinking intra versus inter, uh, they also have to consider yeah, solar. Yeah, and also solar versus. Yeah. Right. And how does that play into each other? And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be very happy to answer that. And um, so just going back to the presentation that I had actually shown. Uh, See, I think the key consideration between intra and inter for any industry has to be with the scale of requirement. Okay. okay. So, so for uh, intrastate solutions, whether solar or wind or a hybrid of those are, uh, you know, very viable and they are very fast and they enable a lot of savings, especially if you're getting banking. Uh, but typically, you know, the kind of connectivity is the scale of connectivity that you will find at intrastate network will be maybe to the tune of 100 megawatt, right? Uh, in very few cases, you find more than that, right? And uh, so I would say that, you know, if you have a scale of requirement between 25 to 30 to even 50 megawatt of power, and you are, you find yourself in a state where wind is available, right? So take an example of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Maharashtra. So all three states have solar and wind available. Uh, there are a lot of customers with various sizes. I think customers up to 10, 15 megawatt within those states are very, they solve their problem with solar. Uh, you go a little beyond that or you have a, you are a little more ambition. You also add wind to that mix. Um, but if you're in a state where there is no wind, for example, if you're in Uttar Pradesh, or if you're in Haryana, or if you're in Odisha, the only option you have is intrastate solar, right? Now, if you have a requirement which is beyond a certain scale, which is, let's say, for example, Hindalco's requirement in a state like Uttar Pradesh or Odisha, uh, that Dr. Uh, Singh was talking about, you know, hundreds of megawatts of power, uh, 
uh, there is no state in the country where you know you can find that scale of power from an intrastate yeah. solution. So the only uh, solution becomes interstate. Now, when you are thinking interstate, you know uh, the biggest consideration that people have today is the transmission charges, the CTU charges, which are waived off till June 2025. But unfortunately, there is not enough capacity which is coming online by June 2025. for industries to take meaningful advantage of that waiver most of the capacity is coming after that and unlike transmission charges in intrastate solutions where they are typically in the range of 20 paisa per unit ctu charges are to the tune of 2 rupees per unit so it's very important uh, that you know you take a high cuf solution and in order to take a high cuf solution which means that if you are if you are taking a 100 megawatt gna Uh, at your consumption side, uh, you should tie up with with generators who can push maximum energy through that hundred megawatt GNA. So a solar plus wind plus pumped hydro storage, or a solar wind and battery storage, or simply a pure solar and wind with oversized wind. You know, two is to one ratio of wind is to solar in a solution. Uh, typically works very well to give you a CUF of around seventy five to eighty percent. and once you reach that kind of cuf for your gna uh, the impact of ctu charges depletes you know depletes considerably and it comes down to the you know 15 to 20 paisa which is the same as stu and when you are displacing that kind of usage right uh, 75 or 80% it's almost impossible to do that using intrastate solutions okay so i believe that it so you know naturally your savings overall savings become much more so uh in a nutshell i would say that you know customers should consider going interstate uh, and when they are going interstate they must look at both solar and wind looking at only solar or looking at only wind will not give you enough cuf uh, you will end up uh, you know losing a lot of money to ctu charges so large demand and uh, once you once you settled on your demand look at displacing a high cuf so go inter uh, go solar and wind and, and uh, one more technology whereas if you have smaller demand you have and when i say smaller anything up to 25 30 megawatts uh, intrastate beats interstate hands down because you can get it quicker you get more savings and even if you can't do displacement like 75 80% even at 50 60% displacement you make good savings so yeah that that uh, let me know if you have any any follow up question to that no uh, thank you uh, thank you for uh, uh, everyone i'll come back to you uh, again uh, i come back to you uh, uh, dr pedashini uh, as someone with experience in uh, esg uh, ratings could you please elaborate on the role of esg rating in facilitating the decarbonization of the steel industry how does this rating contribute to the industry efforts to reduce its environmental impact and adopt sustainability practices um so esg rating based on my experience provided tangible way to gauge a company's environmental impact and they delve into carbon emission energy efficiency and resource management uh, shedding light on uh, where improvements are needed uh, so i think transparency and disclosure uh, as a as a, my role multi role that i played in as csr yes sustainability community relation esg at indalco i have seen how esg rating drive transparency uh, they compel companies to openly share their sustainability practices and goals fostering competition to excel in sustainable initiative uh, when we talk about investor attraction personally i have witnessed the impact of esg rating in attracting investors who value sustainability responsible investors bring not only the capital but also the shared commitment and uh, to deca- decarbonization uh also you know stakeholder engagement is something that uh, in my experience underscores the importance of engaging the communities and adhering to ethical government standards governance standards actually and um, esg rating emphasizes these aspects uh, pushing companies to actively involve stakeholders in decarbonization like you know our vendors we we constantly work with our vendors we constantly work with the community the government uh, the 
sales of partners it gives us a competitive advantage through through my work i have observed that how high esg ratings can different seat companies they enhance market share and customer loyalty by showcasing a strong commitment to sustainability risk mitigation is a very important factor esg ratings in my experience serves as a valuable tool to identify and mitigate sustainability related uh, risk proactive measures and mitigation strategies can help prevent environmental incidents and legal challenges um also the innovation uh, drivers are uh, very important and my involvement with sustainability initiative has shown me uh, that esg rating incentivizes innovation so companies are compelled to explore cleaner technology sustainable practices and improve their rating so slowly slowly we have invented uh, i have our our r&d team has made aluminum bulkers aluminum uh, you know racks so aluminum is almost all are now getting into many uh, you know segments so the regulatory compliances like my personal experience um, uh, from my personal experience if you ask me uh, the the uh, con- that, that, that this confirms that esg ratings uh, are aligned with evolving environmental regulations achieving higher rating helps companies to stay ahead of uh, uh, the compliance regulations uh, So Hindalco has been under you know in uh, consecutively for three years has been most sustainable um, ESG you know top ESG rating uh, in three years that also motivates us to do more on these ESG in the aluminium sector. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Pidarshini. Uh, Mr. Varun, uh, turning to you, what specific actions or uh, support do you believe the government should provide to meet the expectations of the steel industry in its journey towards decarbonization and sustainability practices? Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Karthik. So I think uh, you know clearly the short term focus would be on uh, you know promotion of uh, the right right source of energy. Right. So. Uh, this is where re renewable energy plays a critical role um and this i think there's already quite a bit of impetus which is coming in like we've seen from from karthik and and sobik's presentation i think the maximum support would probably come on two fronts uh, one is on green hydrogen because uh, currently the unit economics don't work right so it's unaffordable to use a uh, green hydrogen so i think that is one key thing second is from a regulatory point of view um and i think probably karthik's presentation uh, uh spoke about this which is the uh you know how do we deal with international regulation right so uh, uh please please bear in mind that with the eu's upcoming carbon border adjustment mechanism which is cbam uh nearly 58% of our exports to the eu could fall so i think it's the impetus on the government is primarily on green hydrogen if you ask me that's where the maximum investment support should come in which would enable us to be not only price competitive but also compliant from a regulatory point of view uh, you know because just imagine 58% drop in eu will 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 cause significant damage to uh, a priority sector for the country you know where the the uh, capacity is expected to go up to 300 million tons by 2030 so specifically green hydrogen and second part is how do we ensure that we have the right regulatory mechanisms uh, which is both through political as well as diplomatic channels to make sure that we don't get hit by these uh, by these uh, eu carbon taxes uh, which could be a, a significant blow uh, to our exports thank you uh, thank you uh, varun chopra Uh, it was uh, nice uh, turning to you shobik das uh, green attributes and recs are becoming uh, important market tools in decarbonization uh, can you please elaborate how these work moreover it's a practical uh, is it practical for any steel company to continue the status quo of carbon in, uh, intensive activities and offset them using these market tools right just before answering that i will just you know what varun said and add on to that bang on see the, on the green hydrogen part because we are uh, you know interacting with steel customers for green hydrogen and captive green hydrogen even if you take 
three rupees, let us say, is the power cost. That's how you, how much you would find, you know, if you one goes through the Odisha renewable energy policy, industrial policy, they are giving a subsidy, etc. So let us say I have 24 into 7 green energy available from grid. Now even there, if you back, you know, if you consider on a thumb rule basis, 60% is the cost of the electricity, you will end up at 3.7 dollars. So there is no need for the customer to go for green hydrogen unless and until there is there are certain incentives from the government. And this can actually you know, create the market which is not there. Today, what we are aiming is for very large market size, wherein probably through economy of scale, we will generate and then export. Now, there are many issues or challenges related to transportation of green hydrogen. And even on the regulatory front, let me tell you a very specific case. Here, you would be inside the premises of a steel company or a refinery or a petrochem. So you will be within the network of this, this private network and you need a sort of a tripartite agreement and there are precedences of that that so that you can have a, you know, the, this com would do a billing coming inside the premises whether at 11 kV level or at 6.6 kV level because you probably need power at 415 volt level and you would be allowed to do open access directly. So, you know, but small, small things if one, uh, you know, uh, do, do go a little deep and if those, you know, points are, those uh, issues are uh, supported or, and, and this can easily be supported, it's not that it cannot be, uh, uh, then probably, you know, we will have a market, a real market in a place. Now coming back to the question uh, which you asked. So there are two options. One is that uh, what we know is the REC. Now, uh, uh, as far as REC of taking green power probably would make more sense for the steel company. Because what happens by of taking green power, you, uh, you know, are straight away, even if I take an REC cost of one rupee, you are uh, saving that one rupee uh, 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 commercially, right? Plus you are saving probably on the uh, uh, energy cost, overall energy cost. So, uh, whether you, of, I mean, that probably is a very cost effective way, otherwise you can always uh, purchase IDCs from the market. And then there is IRES. Now, in IRES, uh, I mean, there are uh, at times questions asked about the traceability or whether, you know, of, 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 of things. So, what probably companies like, you know, big data centers, etc., even uh, some pharma companies, steel companies also are thinking is that we would rather go for a VPP. Okay, because let us say in IRA, you, uh, the pedigree checking, etc., is a little bit question mark because you get 14 to 16 paisa when, you know, in IEC, that's a regulated market. IRA is not a regulated market as on date. You get it at that, 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 that price. So, so there are there are certain challenges there. So now, what you can, I mean, what the companies are thinking is, so that you know, I would have a VPPA, a virtual power plant, wherein I will enable this uh, a power producer, a power developer to sell to the exchange, and I will, you know, probably take a, a take the risk, uh, all the risks and the benefits back to the power company. Or there are various models whether I also, you know. Uh, uh, come and take some sort of a risk and gain with the help of scholars, so on and so forth. So that's also another very interesting mechanism other than the REC and the IREC, a VPPA, which is becoming uh, popular and uh, uh, in the days to come, we probably would also, you know, there, there should be uh, clear regulations to guide this because what happens is you get into a transaction, for example, today, a lot of unknowns are there in IT transactions. Unknowns are there in storage uh, transactions. And when you get into such transactions, you you, you, you uh, face the difficulty. So, I think these are huge investments which, you know, the companies are making, including us. Uh, so, uh, the, the clarity needs to be there from the government side that how and, uh, you know, why, why and what, what are the uh, different ways that these transactions would be treated, right? For example, REC, you pay a GST. Uh, with IREC, you don't pay a GST, right? So, so, so these are, these are, and, and, and what point of time people would question that, uh, 
right? So, so these are different, uh, you know, challenges. We are different issues. Uh, we, if one thinks through one, uh, uh, you know, can find, you know, would find out, find out. And uh, these are uh, the different ways. Uh, to my understanding, a step by step approach. I go to risk maybe uh, BPCA. Or if I am, you know, comfortable with IREC, IREC, just to answer you in one minute. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sobik. Uh, it was very nice uh, to hear from you uh, and clarify the doubt. Uh, this comes to a conclusion. This discussion has been incredibly insightful and has deepened my understanding of the industry's uh, efforts in decarbonization. I think I thank our extreme panelists, Dr. Uh, Pradarshini, uh, Mr. Varun Chopra, and uh, Mr. Sobik Das, and uh, Karthik uh, Narayan Sharma. Uh, thank you very much for all your insights. Uh, over to you, uh, Sakshi. Thank you so much, Mr. Karthik. Uh, we, uh, we had such a knowledgeable panel discussion today. And uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to each one of you, thank you so much uh, for investing your time and support here. And a very special uh, mention to you, of course, Mr. Karthik, for being a super moderator. And your guidance has greatly enhanced the quality of the discussions today. Uh, as I can see that uh, you know, we, we have a lot of comments in the uh, chat box, but we do not have any specific question and answers as such. So we shall I would like to give a big shout out to our attendees for extending their time and support for the event. Uh, much thanks to our partners, Start Power, Sunshore, and Ampin Energy to help us organize this event. As we conclude, we assure you that we will be back soon with more exciting sessions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye.